to uh, questions from, from delegates or any comments that you'd like to make on, on what you've heard so far? No questions? Well, I'll ask a question then. Is there one? Portugal. A question from Portugal, I believe. And Colombia. We'll start with Portugal. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you, thank you enormously for this uh, extremely interesting, extremely thought-provoking panel. Um, ideas and personal histories that were put forward here today, uh, especially for for a diplomat uh, like me, are are very valuable because. Uh, to a great extent, um, and uh, I have to say, I'm the least knowledgeable of all of my colleagues here. Whereas I've just arrived in Geneva, I've just started working uh, on this matter. It, sometimes it's difficult for a, a public official uh, to, to, to put um, a, a specific um, notion or concept into what are we exactly doing in this context of uh, migration, for example, when people ask me, um, what do you really work on? Uh, essentially, sometimes it's it's not it's not easy for me to answer. I think from from this morning's um, uh, stories, I I can make a better idea about how I myself position myself in this matter. I'm coming myself from a, from a long uh, story of migrants. Um, the Portuguese have this uh, tendency, I suppose, um, and in my family I grew up surrounded by that, but that, that's my personal story, which is not as, half as interesting as yours. Um, one question specifically to all the members of the panel is, you are coming from different continents, from different cultures, from different countries. Have you in any way um, felt uh, the, the, the contact or, or the, the contribution or lack thereof of your national um, authorities beyond consular support, uh, beyond uh, stamping uh, documents in any dimension? That would be uh, very interesting for me to know also because you, all of you fit very well into the new um, definition of a Portuguese immigrant and I would very much like to hear from different uh, persons, uh, how does, could that reflect into my own country's experience? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I think that would be a great question for Yolanda, uh, since uh, she's kept uh, very close ties with the Philippines. How, how involved or you know, what sort of a relationship did you have with the Philippines authorities in uh, your experience living in Japan? Did, did you find that they were helpful? Um, I do not mean to say something bad about my country of birth, but I think in our case, because of, as I already, already said, it was a gender-specific and work-specific migration, on their part there was also a great deal of shame to consider our problems. So. What really happened out there was that it was the civil, uh, the, the NGOs, it was the civil society that really helped in, in trying to look for a way to solve the problems of, of the women who were there. And at, it was after, I guess, another kind of a shame on their part that here they are, they're representing the government and they're not doing something that finally they were also able to work in our favor. And I think also that for, for many of these developing countries, they have so many other issues to deal with already. Uh, you know, when you think about a country like Guinea, which is an extremely poor country, despite the rich natural resources they have, there are so many other issues to deal with that people who voluntarily leave the country in search of opportunities, not refugees, but migrants, voluntary migrants, are the least of their problems. So, yes, we need to get governments more involved, but how do you get them more involved, as uh, Jibril was saying, when they're lacking development, they're lacking funds in so many different sectors, you know? Uh, so, perhaps it depends on what government and what region of the world you're dealing with. Uh, you can perhaps tell us more about your experience, you know, in Portugal a bit more later. 
but uh, I guess it's all uh, you, you're dealing with the, the north-south dichotomy here again when you're trying to answer this specific question. Um, I will take another question. I, I uh, hope that we've partially answered your, your question, Portugal. I uh, will hear from Chile now. Antes de formular la pregunta, no quisiéramos obviar la valoración especial de los testimonios de día que nos han entregado los panelistas y recogemos con obvia proximidad las vivencias de don Alfredo Zabudio, quien en su niñez sufrió las inequidades y violaciones a sus derechos esenciales, las que nadie quisiera para, para nuestros hijos. La experiencia del señor Zabudio nos recuerda el sufrimiento de miles de compatriotas que debieron abandonar el país en momentos un momento sombrío de nuestra historia social y, y política. Junto con reconocer la fortaleza, espíritu de superación y emprendimiento del señor Zamudio, desearíamos aprovechar esta oportunidad para agradecer a la OIM y a otras organizaciones y agencias especializadas por el apoyo decisivo brindado en aquellos momentos a nuestros connacionales. Asimismo, hacemos un reconocimiento a las naciones de acogida, ya que sin su generosidad y apoyo permanente a los refugiados y migrantes no sería posible conocer experiencias de vida exitosas como la que nos acaban de presentar ustedes. Tenemos una inquietud, a, a su juicio, a juicio de ustedes, los panelistas, que han sufrido una experiencia de migratoria, ¿cuál sería a juicio de ustedes las acciones concretas que deberían emprenderse, que era emprender la sociedad en estos momentos, que claramente se ve reflejado un aumento de actitudes más bien xenófobas? Muchas gracias. Alfredo, would you like to take that one? As they say in South America, con gusto. Uh, I will answer in English. It is okay for, for you, colleague Chile. Um, thank you. Is it, is, is it, it is, as you say, thousands and thousands of Chilean went through this. And what I forgot to mention, a small detail, which is not small at all. Uh, IOM, through their work at that time, they got 17,000 people out of Chile and out of the prison at that time. My father was one of the 17,000. So it was a huge number, it was a huge crisis, and it was the right organization, the right person at the right time. And with the right resources, that who are you who provide for those resources? Um, Xenophobia, as uh, Mr. Fowl also mentioned, it is not only a question of the recipient country. It is also in the countries of origin. Um, I see that also in Chile. Um, it is not a generalistic xenophobia, but is, you see the tendencies to some xenophobic sentiments towards some of our Latin American brothers, like immigrants from Colombia. And there are many, many ways of approaching this. How, is how can we combat xenophobia? One is through knowledge. The other is through the attitude of national authorities. The third is the civil society participation. And the fourth is of the immigrants themselves. Instead of being just objects, they need, they need to participate and they need to activate and their voices need to be allowed to come forward. As you became a very visible person on TV of the positive, constructive immigrant who are not seen as just a recipient of things. And then it's on the legal framework. How do you position, how, what kind of rights do migrants have in your countries? If they are seen by the, leg the legislation as they are on the margin of society, that is also the perception that it will be given to those who have an opinion of it. So it is, it is a multiple, there is a, it's, a, it's a building with many windows of opportunities. We can approach this from several points. And we have multiple stakeholders, but first of all, what is important is the willingness to not to accept xenophobia as a natural art of things. 
That is the first step. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Uh, I believe we'll now hear from the delegate from Morocco. Colombia. Yes, and we've got Colombia as well, but uh, we'll start with Morocco, perhaps? Okay. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, je remercie tous les intervenants pour uh, leur intervention très enrichissante. Peut-être uh, une petite uh, remarque pour l'administration de l'OIM. C'est vrai que, uh, que ces remarques ont été très enrichissantes, mais on aimerait aussi avoir un migrant du, du nord vers le sud. Donc, et partager avec nous son expérience dans les pays du sud qui reste aussi très enrichissante. Et on a eu l'expérience dans notre pays, le Maroc, d'avoir des, euh, des migrants venant de, du nord et, ont, et ils ont fait une très bonne expérience au Maroc et ils gardent vraiment un très bon lien. Donc ça, c'est la première remarque. La deuxième, peut-être je voudrais réagir à M. Gibril Fall qui a parlé des... Euh, malheureusement, je n'ai pas assisté à toute son intervention, mais je suis arrivé à la fin et euh, c'était une très bonne chose parce que j'ai accroché le fait de qualifier les diplomates qui sont des euh, migrants de choix, c'est vrai, parce qu'on n'a pas ce problème de, de mobilité, de visa, donc on peut partir et, et voyager d'un pays à un autre, mais euh, c'est l'occasion pour nous aussi d'être vraiment euh, de près et voir comment comment nos migrants se comportent et comment ils sont traités dans les pays d'accueil. Euh, je vous rassure que nous ne restons pas insensibles à leurs problèmes et questions. Donc on rapporte à nos capitales aussi comment ça se passe. Et nous aussi, parce que dans la rue, on n'a pas ce, ce passeport diplomatique qui dit nous sommes des diplomates, donc nous sommes des, des migrants de choix. Mais euh, nous aussi, on, a ce, on voit comment euh, les pays d'accueil euh, euh, se comportent avec nous. Et ça, c'est très important dans nos politiques et dans, et dans nos rapports à, à nos gouvernements. Et donc, euh, voilà, même si nous sommes euh, des migrants de choix, mais nous ne restons, euh, restons pas insensibles. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci d'avoir parlé, parlé de cet aspect-là, parce que c'est vrai que même quand on, on est des migrants, on, on choisit d'être migrant. Ça ne veut pas pour autant dire qu'on ne, qu ne, ne traverse pas les mêmes difficultés que d'autres migrants qui seraient dans une situation plus désavantageuse que la nôtre. Euh, donc on, je pense qu'on a, on, on a les mêmes expériences sur, sur beaucoup de niveaux dans, dans les pays. Mais c'est aussi intéressant d'avoir parlé de, de l'expérience... The, the, the changements qu'on voit en ce moment. We're seeing changes in migration trends where we're seeing a lot of Portuguese now return to former colonies like Angola because of uh, the, the situation in, in Portugal. And that's a very interesting aspect. I think it would be very interesting to hear from, from those Portuguese, from uh, you know, the, the people from the former colonial powers who are returning to the colonies and uh, to hear about their experiences in those countries. But uh, maybe that will be for next time. So uh, let, let, let us now hear from the delegate from Colombia, please. Eh, muchas gracias, señora, y sobre todo muchas gracias a, a todos ustedes, los panelistas, por compartir estas experiencias tan personales y tan íntimas. De verdad que es para nosotros desde acá un privilegio el escucharlos. Eh, siguiendo con el tema de cómo eh, combatir la discriminación eh, en relación con los migrantes, nos preguntamos desde nuestra delegación eh, sobre el papel de la educación y particularmente de la educación primaria y preescolar, porque consideramos nosotros que una educación en la diversidad y en el multiculturismo es supremamente importante y una medida preventiva y definitiva para combatir la discriminación. La formación incluso de la imagen de sí mismo como individuo cuando una persona es, es un niño y la imagen del prójimo, como decimos nosotros en español, del, del, del ser que está cercano a nosotros, pues se ve influida por los textos de estudio, por, los, por, le, por el acceso a los medios de comunicación, la forma como se presenta la imagen del individuo en la televisión, etc. Y, y nos preguntábamos nosotros si pudiera alguno de los panelistas compartir un, alguna experiencia positiva, eh, eh, relevante en relación con educación multicultural 
en los países en los que han eh, vivido y donde han eh, criado a sus hijos. Muchas gracias. Uh, who would like to answer that? I, could, uh, I think I could uh, relate and answer that, and, and hopefully uh, someone else can as well. I think if it wasn't for the education I received, I wouldn't be where I, where I am today. Um, I went to a, a French school uh, until the baccalaureate. Then I studied in the United States. I came uh, knowing three languages already. Uh, I got an undergraduate degree in journalism, then a graduate degree in international communications. And I think that if I didn't have the education and the languages that I spoke, I wouldn't have been able to succeed in a country like France, for instance. When a lot of people advised me not to go to France because it was so difficult for you know, people of color in the media in France, I figured, well, I have this education. I have a bac plus six. I speak four languages. Why wouldn't I succeed in France? And I did. So it goes to show that, you know, migrants, uh, education is an important, is, is an extremely important aspect of the end game, if you will. I think if you have education, then you can succeed, as was the case for me. If I didn't have the languages, if I didn't have English, perhaps I, I, I wouldn't have been able to make it in France. But because I had that, and I had the international background, having lived in the United States, in Kenya, in all these countries, that's what I think made it easier for me to make it, which is not the case for millions of African migrants who go to France, who you know work the low-paying jobs, and who are not able, because of the situation they're in, to, to pursue a higher education. So I think that's, uh, uh, I think, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that point because, uh, you know, it's not just about integrating well, it's not just about assimilation, etc. It's also about what you do and what you make of yourself once you arrive in your country of destination. Alfredo, I think you want to add something on that. Yes, please, thank you. Um, the question is how do we combat or prevent racism and discrimination and with true education. Mm. I would say that all human beings and are an island. It's we live in insular communities. We define ourselves as us and them. And that us and them can create, you know, I, I may be a supporter of a football club, I may be, belong to that political party, I may have 5, 10, 15 different identities during the day. When I speak Spanish, I change something different. That understanding that we have different ways of being us, that perception of us, that comes very early on. And it is essential, I would say vital, for any country who will support the respect to human rights is that they need to educate next generation through not giving them all answers, answers but educate them to have the right questions. Why is it like this? Why are you different? And that is perfectly fine, because a child will ask that question, and they will say, hmm, OK. They will accept, and they will go to next question, and they will go to ne next question. And that is the movement of our societies. But if we define the frame, all answers are here, then they will try to fit what they see into what they have heard is a Chilean, is a Norwegian, is something. So it is to teach your children to be interested in the change. That is the best curriculum we can do in education. Mm. Um, to deal with xenophobia and other forms of sort of discrimination, it's about changing human attitudes. So one has to deal with it from both a rational point of view but perhaps more importantly from an emotional point of view. So you might need specific laws to, allow, to disallow discrimination. That is sort of the law being used the tie, to tie the hands of man. 
but you also need other things that would change the hearts of men, as it were. And specific examples, if you take the United Kingdom, where we did experiment with multiculturalism, perhaps to even at an extent when people thought it had become too politically correct. But you have things going beyond just the stereotype. So you would have children being taught about black scientists and inventors, not only about black sportsmen and singers. That is very serious. When we're talking about the war, World War II, World War II, I, we will talk about the Africans, the Caribbeans, who have fought in that war for Britain. And it's serious things like that you do, and I think it's extremely important because the young, the children, before they learn xenophobia, they accept everything as okay. So we have to put out the counter information and the rational facts and figures are useful, but they are not enough because the xenophobic decisions we make, like many other decisions we make, is not based on rationality at all. Precisely, how precisely do you put out that counter information that you're talking about when in Europe, for instance, right now, we're living in, envir in an environment of, uh, you know, there's a financial crisis and so on, and a lot of the political parties are playing on that, on the fear of people to, to blame migrants for the woes the countries are going through. You know, in, in a country like France, for instance, we have the far right that's doing extremely well well right now in, in opinion polls because precisely of, of the blame that's being laid on migrants. How do you counter then that, that sort of information when even the, the politicians, the people who are supposed to be leading the country, are responsible? I think um, there's a difference between what the political sort of arguments against migration and the general public xenophobia. For the, for the politicians, at least we know what the game is. That France, where politicians are being uh, blaming migrants, even deporting Roma people and things like that, there are people in France of migrant stock who say, we don't want these bloody migrants. They are saying it because now it's an economic argument. Right. Now, the migrants need to ally themselves with the bigger issues. For example, if it's work, in the United Kingdom, we've seen a phenomenon which I thought is quite good, in that the trade unions, who in other countries, the trade unions are saying the migrants are coming and undercutting the local people and getting the jobs. In the United Kingdom, the trade unions are in support of migrants and low low um, income workers and many migrants fall into that category because they know that the bigger argument is about advancing the wages of everyone. Because today if you choose migrants and circumstances change, tomorrow you would pick on other people, women. In fact, in many of the cases, forget the migrants, the women are paid less and discriminated more for many generations on. So I think there's a difference in dealing with the political one to the more general public sort of change of attitude. I think Australia wants to yes. say. Yes, uh, we'll take Australia and, uh, and then we'll allow the Director General to close the session for us. Uh, Australia, please. Thank you very much for giving me the chair and uh, for the phone microphone. I really wanted to ask uh, the question that was that was beckoned for, by uh, Ms. Suda on her passport. Um, this has been such an interesting discussion this morning, and I don't think Ambassador Swing would mind me saying that these uh, opportunities for us to hear migrant voices are often the highlight on the, of the program. And so we thank you very much for your time. But the question of the passport is intriguing. I think I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear the answer from you. I was hoping you'd forget about that. <laughs> It's, it's actually a very difficult um, question also for me. Um, but I think the reason why I hold on to this third world passport is because I love Japan, okay? I think there are many Japanese who are here. Um, a lot of people love Japan. Japan has done a lot of goodwill to the Philippines. But unfortunately, it still has a long way to go with regards to the migrants that are in Japan, including the first generation Koreans and Japanese. Many of the issues that they have there are not yet, um, are not yet um, 
uh, are not yet really discussed in society. Therefore, the problems that they have trickles down to us, the newcomer migrants. Now, with regards to my passport, I think the reason why I hold on to it is because I want to be a speck of dust in their eyes. That here is a third world woman who, is not afraid, who was not afraid. Of course, I had choices. I could have lived in Australia, which I did for some time. And also in the United States, I could have easily been gone there, got citizenship, and have a good life, better life, easier to go to different countries. Uh, but I was not afraid to go back to that difficult country and hold on to that one last um, what, um, symbol. symbol of being this person who is resilient, who is not afraid, and that I'm going to be part of the solution. That is, I work in the educational system, I work with the Japanese, and I think that my contribution would be on that side. And so do a lot of the Filipino women in Japan. They were the early English teachers in their own communities. Their English is not perfect. We are not considered as quote unquote native speakers of English, but it is through their efforts in their own small communities that they are also able to be, to, to say that we are not afraid despite of our difficult lives of, of our images, the stereotypes in Japanese society, we are going to be a positive force in that society. And I hold on to my passport forever, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yolanda. Thank you. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from uh, Ambassador Swain uh, to wrap up this session for us. It's been a very interesting morning. Thank you again for inviting us. Thank you very much. Anything that I might have to say would probably be an anticlimax to these very, very interesting uh, presentations we've had. Uh, I, I think we've heard four uh, interesting migrant voices, four stories, uh, uh, migrant stories very different in their own way and yet probably connected in many ways too. I wouldn't uh, dare try to summarize it, but I do think there are some common themes that emerge. One I think is simply the challenge that migrants face, uh, uh, simply uh, in surviving what we call survival migration or desperation migration, which is becoming increasingly uh, the, the, uh, the theme, uh, the, the trend of our time. Um, the uh, stereotypes uh, that uh, cast very long and dark shadows across the pathways of, of, the, of the migrants uh, that, that can tip over very quickly into being xenophobia, uh, something that we all have to guard against. Uh, I think the hard work and the resilience is a word that was used very often that, that is required in order not just to survive but eventually to succeed. And yet out of this all the belief that somehow or other the difficulties that they faced in the end made you probably better and stronger and more positive people, which is really I think probably the best outcome that one uh, really could hope for. Um, and I think it's good that we come out on that positive note and recognize again by doing this panel, we're simply emphasizing that migration is all about people and we cannot lose that in the midst of statistics and talks about uh, generalities about migration. Um, I would so also like to just one word of caution. I think that although the migrant voices have mentioned specific countries, that may be with some discomfort for the countries that were mentioned, their, their representatives, the difficulties that the migrants mention are uh, applicable to all countries. I think, I don't think any of us are spared that. And a lot of, we heard a lot about that, it, that even in South-South migration, there's a good deal of discrimination and, um, and stereotypes that, that, that occur there. So let's say that just to, in order that people don't feel sensitive about it, um, and I think that leads me to say also that in mentioning the, these problems, uh, the broad applicability of migrants' experiences is why we are launching this global information campaign, which you will see later in the day, and which, for which we will be seeking uh, a lot of support. So let me simply ask you to give a round of very well-merited applause for all of our moderator and the members of our panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you.